To outline today's event, the webinar in its entirety will run approximately two hours, which includes Q&A panels. And if you have questions now or during the webinar, please enter those questions into the Q&A chat pod. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. It's our pleasure to welcome our speakers first for an overview. We're welcoming Dr. Raj Madhavushi, Associate Director, Guidance and Policy Team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Office of Translational Sciences in CEDAR. And next, we'll learn about health communication for optimal drug therapy, examples of drugs that interact with cytochrome P and enzymes and transporter systems by Dr. Joseph Grillo, Associate Director, Labeling and Health Communication Team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology and the Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR. This will take us into our first Q&A panel. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Matabushi. Greetings, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all to the webinar series titled Navigating Complex Waters, a deep dive into FDA drug interaction guidances and resources. My name is Raj Madhubushi. I'm the Associate Director for Guidance and Scientific Policy in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology. And I will be providing a high level overview. At the heart of the webinar are two key concepts heterogeneity in drug response, and therapeutic individualization. We all know that there is variation in how individual patients respond to a treatment. Understanding and accounting for this variability is essential to achieve therapeutic individualization. Variable responses can often be attributed to a variety of extrinsic and intrinsic factors. And clinical pharmacology principles are often applied to evaluate the impact of these factors and help translate this information uh, to derive the knowledge to inform drug labeling through the in instructions of use. The focus of one such factor in this webinar is drug interactions. In real world, Patients may be required to be on more than one drug as part of their treatment strategy. In such situations, there is a potential for drug interactions to occur, which may impact safety or efficacy, resulting in altered benefit risk. Therefore, it's important to assess the drug interaction potential for new medicinal products during their drug development. However, it's impractical to evaluate every drug interactions in clinical trials during the drug development. Hence, we rely on systematic risk-based strategies to characterize the drug interaction potentials. To this end, regulatory agencies have developed guidelines to assist drug developers. FDA has a long history of providing guidance on the design, conduct, and interpretation of drug interaction studies. In 2020, we published two final guidances for conducting in vitro and clinical drug interaction studies, primarily focused on enzyme and transported mediated interactions. You may remember the SBI webinar on this topic from April of 2020. In addition, we have the physiological based PK and the population PK guidances that also discuss model-based assessments for drug interaction, evaluation, and prediction. More recently, we saw global harmonization efforts in this space with the publication of the ICH M12 drug interactions draft guideline last year. Complementary to these guidances, we also have labeling guidances and resources that assist in the translation of drug interaction information to use. One such guidance listed here is the Clinical Pharmacology Labeling Guidance, and to the right is a web resource of the tables of substrates, inhibitors, and inducers tailored to support drug development. While these efforts have been highly impactful, it should be noted that the drug interaction space is broad and more needs to be done, especially in the evaluation of non enzyme or non transporter mediated interactions. Clarifying expectations in specific therapeutic contexts 
providing approaches to assessment of drug interaction potential for biologics and emerging modalities. And lastly, developing resources tailored to support healthcare providers. Over the next two days, you will hear more about the progress we have made on these fronts. First, you will learn about the new website tailored for healthcare providers we launched in June this year. This will be followed by three new guidances that were published this year. First, for the evaluation of gastric pH dependent drug interactions, understanding the clinical drug interaction study expectations with combined oral contraceptives, and drug-drug interaction assessment for therapeutic proteins. I hope you will have a great time navigating these three new guidances and get a deeper understanding of the new labeling resource that we have developed. Thank you. Thank you to SBIA for inviting me here today to talk to you about an exciting new resource FDA has developed for healthcare providers to help identify drugs that can be involved in drug-drug interactions involving SIP and transporter-based systems. Just two quick disclaimers. One, the websites that I'm going to discuss today are not meant to be a comprehensive list of all possible interacting drugs, but rather a guide. And also, the websites that we'll be talking about focus more on SIP enzyme and transporter-based drug interactions, but there are other types of drug interactions, such as those that affect the drug's absorption or interactions that affect the drug's protein binding or other types of interactions such as pharmacodynamic interaction. So first, just a quick note about drug interactions. As we know, you know, it's a major cause of drug-related adverse events. It's a major contributor to hospitalizations and emergency department visits. And unfortunately, as the third bullet shows in the slide, uh, in a recent survey uh, a few years ago, um, it showed that a lot of these very common drug-drug interactions are often filled at pharmacies without warning uh, the patient. So it is a very significant uh, health, uh, public health issue. So uh, very big interest to, uh, to FDA. So we have three sites that are dedicated to um, drug-drug interactions, uh, two of them more specifically to the SIP and transporter based interactions, really because if you look at the number of drug interactions, the majority often are caused by either uh, an interaction with the SIP enzymes, transporter systems, or what we call um, um, phase two uh, metabolizing enzymes. So uh, that's why um, the, the, we're focusing our attention more on these because these are by far uh, more common. So um, first would be uh, the industry site. We've had that for um, about over a decade, and it's really geared more toward industry and the drugs that you would use in uh, drug development for specific drug-drug interaction studies um, and in, in the clinical uh, studies that are used for the uh, safety and approval assessment uh, of a drug. Uh, the other is a public site. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, only because uh, that site is currently under development, but it's uh, designed really for uh, the average uh, citizen to look at and get some thoughts on drug-drug uh, interactions, also try to explain a little bit more about what these SIP enzyme systems are and transporter systems in a more uh, understandable, less technical uh, way. And we're hoping uh, once we launch the new site that, that it will be even more informative uh, to, uh, to patients. And then the last is a new site, which is really what we're going to focus on today. It's a healthcare provider uh, specific site where uh, it gives uh, examples that have been vetted um, by FDA, uh, but again, not comprehensive, um, that um, um, uh, look at you know, specific examples of SIP uh, drugs that affect SIP enzymes uh, or transporter systems or uh, drugs that are affected by these SIP uh, enzymes or transporter uh, systems as a resource, again, for, for the healthcare uh, professional. A moment ago, the, the site that we had developed originally for the pharmaceutical industry uh, has been around for over a decade. And it's really a very basic site. It's, it's actually a list of tables. Um, and it's broken down into um, drugs that uh, industry might select for in vitro or, or more the um, you know, bench chemistry type uh, studies. 
Um, another is the clinical index drug. So when they do dedicated studies looking at a drug's effect on a specific CYP enzyme or transporter system, they would select these drugs because we have very good, uh, you know, information about relative potency and you know the the degree to which they are specific for that for that enzyme. And then lastly would be a table of clinical substrates inhibitors and inducers which um, could be used, for example, if they were analyzing one of the reg larger registration studies and wanted to look at some potential uh, interacting drugs you know within the big population that that they studied, we give that list of of examples too, and we have similar uh, you know for I could say for enzymes sip enzymes and for transporters and then within each group, um, with the exception of the transporters that's broken down into um, inhibitors, inducers, and what we call substrates. That is, uh, a drug is affected by um, an inhibitor of the of, of the enzyme. Um, so, um, so that so that's the um, industry-based site. Choose uh, with this site. While healthcare providers have access to it, it's not really ideal for use in the clinical setting because, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's really just a set of tables for very specific, you know, enzymes and very specific categories. And each is its own kind of, of thing, right? So, unfortunately, it's very rare that a, a particular drug either affects or is affected by only one SIP enzyme or one transporter system. In the real world, it's usually a very complex, you know, situation. And while this is captured in the um, in the old in the in the sponsor uh, um, pharmaceutical industry uh, focused site, it's really challenging because a lot of the extra information is in really these footnotes underneath the table. So for example here, and this is an older um, example since, since this particular clinical uh, table doesn't exist anymore since we have the new format that I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, but this would show like, for example, if you're looking at gemfibrozil, you would have to look, you know, aside from looking specifically at it being a strong inhibitor of a uh, CYP2C8, you would have to go to the footnotes to find out that it's also an inhibitor of OP1B1 and an O3 transporter systems. So that might be challenging in the, in the clinical um, setting. So it's really, really not ideal for healthcare providers, but it's worked very well for, for industry. Given the, the, the fact that the SIP and transporter-based um, drug-drug interactions are you know, the most common drug interactions that, that we see, we really thought it was worthwhile to develop another resource directed toward healthcare professionals that was a little bit easier to use, a little bit more comprehensive as far as the results that, that they get, and I'll explain that, you know, in a second. And, and then ultimately what we did was, rather than have two separate tables, then we used this new um, clinical format also in the industry-sponsored site. So that's why I said, before that, that the example I showed you was it was an older snapshot of, of that since it, it's not there anymore. This, if you were to click on the link for the clinical sites in the industry, you would come to this pages as well. Um, so what's different between them? Well, one is it's searchable, and the other, the big difference is you get all relevant information in one place. So if you look uh, at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see the results. So this is where again we're searching for uh, a strong cyp 28 inhibitor, and here you get zemfibrozol, but you also get the transporter-related drug-drug interactions. And yes, it's a little different here because this is an updated um, site, whereas the, the other site was an older site. Um, but, but as you can see here, the, the benefit is all of the information about that specific drug, whether it's inhibited by or inhibits or, um, uh, you know, is all in one place, you know, for, for you to see, you know, all all at once. So that we think that's much more helpful, hopefully, for, for a healthcare provider audience. Some thoughts on how to use it. So uh, again, it's meant to be a little bit more user friendly. We have these drop down filters. And if you look on the right side of the screen, the lower right there, you'll see what a drop down looks like. Would have For this example, it's weak inducers. So it would have all these different um, SIP enzymes. And you could pick um, one of those. And then it would give you that table below. Uh, that would have, you know, all the drugs that, that would be, um, you know, weak SIP um, 
uh, inducers of whatever enzyme you pick. Uh, the other thing you could do, there's a free, if you look in the lower left uh, red box, there's a free form search option where you could type in the name of the drug. Um, we use the generic um, drug name. Uh, so um, that would be the, you know, the best way to, to, to find them. Uh, wouldn't kind of return with the brand name. Um, and the third thing that's really nice is you could actually export your results or export the entire table if you don't search for anything. So there is an option to export uh, as an Excel spreadsheet uh, if you wanted to keep the results uh, for, for whatever reason. Some other thoughts on how to optimize your searches. Um, so again, you know, uh, refine your search. You could use the filters and the search box. One little, you know, caveat uh, with the search box is, um, again, you have to use the drug substance name, not the proprietary name. And um, it also ignores certain symbols. So, you know, when I gave those there in red, the period, the parentheses, et cetera. Um, so you just have to remember that. Um, and, and an example shows you of like how, you know, writing um, two different ways would give the same, the same result because it ignores that, that um, apostrophe. And then lastly, uh, just keep in mind that both the filter and the search box are, are an end function. So if you, were, for example, were to select two different filter boxes, they would be considered an end. So you would get all the drugs that met both criteria. So it's not an or. If you want to do an or, you have to do two separate searches. And that limitation, unfortunately, is a limitation of just the platform FDA has and its website. And, you know, we just have to work with it within that. But um, but those are, are just some ideas on um, on search. The last thing is just one special situation I wanted to call your attention to. Being older myself, I sometimes tend to um, increase the font size in some of my you know websites and email. And, um, you know, we all tend to use sometimes our, our phones. And, and what happens sometimes is if the uh, information table, the result table, is too big for your screen, what will happen is you'll see that little plus box there on the left hand side in the red box. And what you'd have to do is hit that plus box. And if you look at the, the right side of the screen, it will provide a drop down with the uh, row with the columns that were uh, truncated. So just remember that if you see that plus sign, you need to click on it so that you'll get the full uh, picture of the um, the effects uh, the drug has or is affected by you know, CYP and, and enzymes and transporter system. But that's really the only, um, you know, the only caveat you have to remember. And that's, again, only if you, you know, tend to um, use the non-standard, you know, screen. But for most screens, it should, it should work fine. But I did want to call that, call that to your attention. Um, I just wanted to bring your attention to this new, you know, really exciting resource. I'm very excited about it. A lot of folks here at the agency are very excited about it. We're hoping um, that this is really helpful for um, for healthcare providers. Uh, we would love to have your feedback uh, uh, if you have any thoughts on the quality, clarity, utility of this you know this website or the information in this you know website. We do try to um, update it as often as possible, at least you know quarterly, unless there's you know an urgent update, which we would do immediately. Um, and so, if you have any thoughts, this is our uh, office uh, website. Um, I will see it if you send it. So um, it comes. Yeah, I'm one of the people who monitor this website, uh, this email address box. So um, so please feel free to send in uh, send in feedback. We'd love love to hear it. Challenge question. So um, I'll read through them and then give you a minute to think about it. So the question is, which of the following statements is not true? Not true. So A is the FDA industry-focused drug-drug interaction website contains separate lists of recommended index drugs for use in evaluating CYP enzyme or transporter system effects on a drug in vitro or in vivo, as well as clinical examples. B, the majority of drug interactions reported in the U.S. Uh, drug prescribing information involve CYP enzymes and transport systems. C, FDA healthcare provider focused website is a comprehensive list of all drugs that affect and are affected by CYP enzymes and transport systems. And D, drug interactions are an important contributor to emergency department visits and hospital admissions. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, and the correct answer is C. C is not correct, right? It's not a comprehensive list. It's really just a guide of um, 
of uh, examples that were vetted by uh, FDA. And um, if you look at other sites, they may have different levels of conservatism as far as um, uh, their criteria for, for accepting the relative potency or uh, whether or not a, a drug inhibits or is inhibited by a system. So this is really, you know, what, what FDA has, um, you know, has found to be, um, you know, meet their criteria. And also, um, obviously, new things are happening every day. So, you know, something may have just been found to be an inhibitor or something that may not be captured. So it's, so definitely should not be considered a comprehensive list, but hopefully uh, you'll find it a useful guide. Talk and thank you so much for your kind attention, and I hope you use this resource, and I hope it, uh, it benefits you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you for the great presentations. We'll now transition into our Q&A panel session. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We'd like to welcome to the Q&A panel, Dr. Shinning Yang, Policy Lead, Guidance and Policy Team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, and the Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR. Looks like we have some questions coming in right now. The first group of questions is direct to, to Dr. Matabushi, Dr. Raj Matabushi, and here is the first questions. What considerations are needed for drugs with very high plasma protein binding greater than 99% protein bound? Thank you, Ray. That's a very uh, nice question. and. It has been the focus for our guidances uh, as they are related to the enzymes and uh, transported related interactions. So uh, for many of these uh, enzyme based or transporter based interactions, uh, there are in vitro based screening approaches which uh, are uh, performed to figure out whether clinical studies are required or not. And as part of it, there is, in that calculus, there is a, a protein, a plasma protein binding implication. Historically, for drugs which have been very highly protein bound uh, drugs, uh, we have resorted to a default of 1% free fraction because there were challenges with uh, accurately and precisely estimating the pro protein binding for these highly protein bound drugs. Uh, but over past several years, there have been uh, advances made in this area. And we now have reports that, 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 that it's possible to accurately and precisely measure even the free fractions of these very highly protein bound drugs. And as such, in the ICHM12 draft guideline, we have moved towards uh, potentially using the measured protein binding in these instances if the pr plasma protein binding methods have been demonstrated to be uh, robustly um, accurate and precise. So that's the progress that has been made with respect to uh, plasma protein binding for highly protein bound drugs. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. Matabushi, and here is the next question. What other mechanisms or modalities related guidances relating to drug interactions are being developed? Another excellent question. So when, when we uh, published our, or finalized the, uh, the 2020 guidance on drug, drug interaction, the approach that we took was we we took on the, the broadest uh, scope of uh, drug interaction space, which was covered by the cytochrome P450 enzymes as well as transporters. However, we realized that we would not be able to apply all the principles there for other situations and maybe uh, for some of the emerging modalities. But we used those two guidances as these umbrella are overarching because they covered a good portion of the drug interaction space. Uh, since then, uh, we have focused on areas which have not, which have, which have been out of scope for those guidances. And over the next two days, you'll be hearing 
uh, specifically uh, with respect to therapeutic proteins as well as uh, uh, acid reducing agents uh, such as antacids or proton pump inhibitors as such. In addition to that, uh, there are other areas, emerging areas or emerging modalities, and we have tried to address those as part of specific uh, comprehensive clinical pharmacology considerations uh, related guidances as they pertain to these emerging modalities. For example, last year we had two such guidances, the clinical pharmacology considerations for antibody drug conjugates. As part of that guidance, there are unique uh, th there is a specific section on how to navigate the drug-drug interaction uh, scenario. Similarly, in June of last year, we had uh, a, we published a draft guideline for uh, clinical pharmacology considerations for oligonucleotide therapeutics. Uh, even there, we have a dedicated section on how to navigate uh, drug oligonucleotide therapeutic interaction space. And most recently, in September of this year, we have. Uh, we, we published the draft guideline uh, on clinical pharmacology considerations for peptide products. And even there, we devote a specific section on uh, uh, drug interaction potential with uh, uh, therapeutic peptides. So we have been uh, trying to address all these other areas or with other modalities, how they are being addressed. They might not be standalone drug interaction guidances, but they are covered as part of the larger clinical pharmacology considerations in these areas. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question in this round for Dr. Matabushi, and here is the final question. Can you tell us the status of the ICH guidelines on drug interactions? Yeah. Uh, so the ICH guidelines, the ICH M12 drug interaction study guideline is a global harmonization uh, effort. And to this end, uh, we have been following a work plan uh, with an intention target of uh, finalizing uh, the, the the guideline uh, towards the end of the first quarter of next year. So we are on track for it. And at this point of time, we are uh, trying to address the comments that we got through the public commenting period. Uh, and we look forward to that publication towards the end of the first quarter, somewhere around March of uh, 2024. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a few questions that came in for Dr. Joseph Grillo. And here's the first question for Dr. Grillo. How often is the DDI site updated for healthcare professionals? Thanks for the question. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great one. So we try to update the website on a routine basis quarterly. Of course, if there's a um, specific, you know, issue that represents, you know, public health, you know, public health risk or something that's, um, you know, serious, we'll make the change immediately. But we try to at least, you know, quarterly uh, take a look at what new information is available, you know, and, and make any, you know, revisions or uh, updates. Uh, to the to the website. Thanks. Thanks for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Grillo is the following: What is the difference between the DDI website from FDA and the DDI website from the database from the Indiana University School of Medicine? Thanks. Um, that's a very good question as well. Um, there are two completely separate, you know, entities. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some some similarities, but obviously, you know, FDA has different criteria than in the University of Indiana might have uh, with regard to what gets, you know, included, you know, in each resource. Obviously, FDA, um, we're probably more on the conservative side. We really don't like to engage in anything that's, you know, speculative or, uh, you know, so things that we uh, would include on our, you know, uh, website, would be, you know, something that we feel um, there's a good bit of data and it's, it's you know, 
very clearly been, um, you know, been been shown to either affect that pathway or or the drug is metabolized, you know, by, by that pathway. So they're really, you know, they're, they're two different databases. Um, I'm sure, like I say, I'm sure there'll be some similarities in them, but, um, you know, each, you know, each group has their own, you know, criteria and there's, you know, um, going to be, um, you know, there might be some differences, you know, they may have, um, you know, things that um, maybe has, have less evidence or, or something, you know, I, I couldn't speculate. Um, but anyway, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Grillo, and it is the following. Can you provide direct links to industry, healthcare, and public sites? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I did actually provide those links uh, on my slide, the one that had the three, you know, bubbles. Uh, if you look in the lower um, right-hand side of that slide, you'll see three uh, links that that are direct go directly to those um, those various uh, sites. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a few questions that came in for Dr. Shining Yang, and here is the first question for Dr. Yang: Are the substances classified as, as sensitive substrates based on and inhibition or induction data. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. So the classification generally is based on inhibition data, but not induction data. The reason is that enzyme inducers, they often induce multiple enzyme pathways. So from uh, induction data, it's difficult uh, to test out, you know, uh, the interaction come from uh, which pathway. So in general, we use uh, inhibition data to make a classification on a drug uh, as a, you know, uh, a sensitive substrate or moderate sensitive substrate uh, of a certain uh, enzyme or transporter. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Yang is the following. To make the healthcare professional example table, does the interaction need to be proven clinically or just via in vitro experiments adequate to show up on your list? Uh, well, we uh, generally based on that uh, on clinical uh, DDI uh, studies, um, well, that, that doesn't uh, mean, you know, in vitro data does not uh, give a, a clue um, that, uh, you know, for health provider use, we generally based on clinical data. Uh, one reason is also uh, clinical DDI study uh, tell us, uh, uh, you know, exactly what's the magnitude of the DDI so that we can put it in different uh, category. For example, sensitive substrate or moderate sensitive substrate or strong inhibitor or moderate uh, inhibitor. Uh, but uh, I want to mention one thing that, uh, for example, for transporter inhibitors, uh, for BCRP uh, transporter inhibitors or for OETP transporter inhibitors, uh, some inhibitors, they are dual inhibitor of both BCRP and uh, OETP1B. Uh, but in the past, uh, uh, quite a few studies uh, were conducted with a substrate called rosoastatin, one of the statin drugs commonly used. So a setting is a dual substrate of both transporter BCRP and OETP1B. Uh, so, you know, in such case, uh, uh, we may have to look into in vitro data, you know, to have a, a rough idea about how likely the drug inhibition effect uh, reflected by the SWAT setting AOC change is more to come from BCRP inhibition or OETP1B inhibition. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. Yang, and here's the next question. What is the current understanding of false positive results from in vitro DDI studies that result in clinical DDI studies for transporters and SIPs? Uh, 
Well, um, if I understand correctly, it means that uh, from uh, in vitro data, we predict that uh, there would be uh, significant uh, interaction in clinical DDI study. However, it turned out uh, to be uh, insignificant or negative results. Uh, well, you know, uh, we try to, um, you know, uh, reduce the number of false positive, uh, uh, while, you know, uh, keep uh, minimizing false negative prediction. Um, but it depends on which criteria is used for the simple criteria used at the beginning. So that it's the first uh, uh, line to, to make a, a rough or qualitative prediction. The criteria is set in a way tend to be a bit conservative. So after that, uh, you know, companies uh, can have the choices uh, to uh, leverage other tools or information, for example, modeling approach to make a, a bit more quantitative prediction. Um, and also very recent, uh, in the recent several years, there has been significant advances uh, in the area of endogenous biomarker for transporters, uh, especially for OETP 1B, which can help um, which can be, you know, uh, relatively easy to incorporate in uh, early uh, uh, clinical studies to to help uh, uh, tell us, you know, whether the individual effect uh, can translate into EUO effect or not. Uh, this is expected uh, to help reduce uh, some of the uh, false positive avoid uh, conducting some uh, unnecessary clinical DDI studies. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one final question for Dr. Yang in this round, and here's the question. Is there any benefit of conducting in vitro transporter DDI studies in vesicles instead of cells, and is there a guidance on addressing this? Uh, well, in the uh, guidance, uh, uh, we um, uh, didn't give very specific recommendation uh, because, uh, you know, vesicles is uh, also a commonly used tool, has been there for, uh, for, 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 for quite a while. Um, it will depend on, on the experience uh, and the, the, um, the choice of a company. So there's uh, some advantage using vesicles uh, compared to uh, cells, uh, especially for influx transporter uh, PGP or BCRP because the cell system, uh, I mean, the, the, the transport system uses KCO2, MDCK, or ISAPK. Uh, they need, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the bicycle had the advantage of, you know, more suitable for, for high uh, throughput. So there has been a um, recent, uh, very recent uh, two uh, interesting publications. One is from uh, Merck, the other is from uh, Pfizer. They compared the um, IC50 of uh, a number of drugs measured using uh, both systems and they made a comparison. Uh, it seemed that, uh, you know, the bicycles uh, are uh, reasonably good for that purpose. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving back to the, our previous panelist, Dr. Joseph Grillo. We have a few questions that just came in for Dr. Grillo. And here's the first question going back to a FDA Duke Margolis workshop on drug interactions a few years ago. The majority of the physician participants preferred inclusion of a link to an FDA website of vetted interacting drug examples for SIP and transporter-based drugs rather than a listing a few examples of these interactive drugs in the PI. What does the FDA think about using the new website, Healthcare Professional Focused website, for this purpose? Uh, thank you for that question. That's actually a great question. Um, you're correct. We did have a workshop uh, just prior to the pandemic where we had healthcare providers um, uh, come in and we had uh, some focused discussion regarding their thoughts on um, labeling. And uh, there was a follow on a white paper where, um, you know, those issues were, were uh, published and, uh, you know, the discussion was published. And one of those things, you know, that, that the um, healthcare providers had suggested was rather than, um, you know, providing a list of um, a partial list of examples um, that we usually do uh, sometimes in, in labeling. Um, you know, the problem being that those can become outdated or sometimes healthcare providers find those um, to be, 
uh, you know, they assume it's comprehensive when it really isn't comprehensive. So the thought would be, you know, could we have like a, you know, something like a, a website or something where, um, you know, where we can keep it more up to date and we could, um, or without having to, you know, change the label and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so right now, unfortunately, FDA doesn't have a policy on using a link in that way, having a link in, in uh, the drug interaction section, section seven, that would go uh, to this website. But as I'm sure you're aware from the uh, you know, guidance agenda that we are currently working on a, a drug interaction labeling guidance for that drug interaction section. And of course, you know, we're taking you know, all of the feedback that we had gotten from, uh, from that meeting as well as other feedback we've gotten from you know, industry and, um, you know, and, and others and, and incorporating you know, those, those, uh, those comments as best we can into, into the uh, you know, into the developing, you know, policy. So, uh, so stay tuned, you know, um, uh, right now, though, we don't really have a policy on actually putting uh, that type of a link in, in, in the label itself. Um, but definitely, you know, the need for a site such as what we developed, uh, you know, we definitely got, um, you know, got, got some positive feedback on that from that, from that meeting. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question came from Dr. Grillo, and here's the question. When will the new website of FDA's examples of drugs that interact with SIP enzymes and transporter systems for healthcare professionals contain examples of other metabolic pathways, such as glucuronidation? Uh, so, so right now, um, you know, we don't have that on the on the website. Obviously, we're always looking for examples that we have the confidence, you know, to include in the website for all those different pathways. So those would be the more the, the you know the phase two, um, you know, meta metabolic pathways. Um, and so, absolutely, once you know we get to a point where we feel there are examples that you know meet our criteria for. Uh, inclusion, you know, those definitely would be, would be included. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving back to Dr. Shending Yang. Here's a question that came in for Dr. Yang, and it's the following. How are drug nutrient interactions determined, particularly as it relates to dietary supplements? Yeah, there are a variety of nutrient supplements, um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't have uh, as good understanding on this as uh, uh, drugs development by uh, companies. A uh, lot of them have been there for quite a while, but uh, you know, no one uh, have done a systemic analysis into the components of uh, those uh, uh, supplements. There are uh, several. Uh, uh, ex uh, 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 several well-known examples like Grifo uh, uh, Druids, which uh, you know inhibit uh, CYP3A, and the uh, uh, Syndrome's word, which uh, uh, is an inducer of uh, CYP3A. Um, for for those, um, you know, we uh, can leverage some uh, prior knowledge on uh, this, uh, 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 you know, Druids or beverage or that or supplements. Uh, and also consider the characteristic uh, of an uh, investigative drug, uh, like uh, you know how much C3A plays a role in the pharmacokinetic of uh, the investigative drug. Um, but for uh, other uh, you know uh, uh, supplements, uh, I'm thinking like uh, you, you know green tea or uh, some other herbal uh, medications. Uh, uh, definitely, you know, need uh, more work from uh, from the whole uh, community. Um, you know, one example may be uh, cannabis uh, containing product, uh, you know, because of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the nowadays, you know, um, this are uh, uh, used uh, uh, quite often. Um, but in the past, uh, there hasn't been that many study conducted. Uh, there has been a cannabis uh, containing product uh, approved. Uh, the companies, uh, you know, has done uh, clinical DDI studies uh, looking at the effect of uh, uh, their product uh, on uh, several other uh, 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 several major SIP enzyme, uh, but but we know on the market uh, or in, in real world uh, there are a number of uh, other form of uh, the cannabis uh, containing product or derived product used. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, recently there has been a study, clinical DDI study conducted uh, by um, academic uh, researchers, uh, including uh, Washington State University. They published that uh, on clinical pharmacology therapeutics, um, I think earlier this year. Uh, so this will help a lot with the field of knowledge gap, although there is a still, you know, uh, significant knowledge gap. So personally, I highly encourage and hope that uh, uh, academic researchers uh, or hospital researchers uh, uh, and the other uh, stakeholders uh, can, you know, uh, uh, conduct more work, uh, you know, in vitro and the clinical work uh, to fill the knowledge gap. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Shenning Yang, and it's referring to can you can you um, see how can you explain how this applies or is the applications to pediatric drug development? Yeah, this is a, another great question. Um, in the uh, Raj and the Joe, uh, please feel free to chime in. So uh, for pediatric drug. Um, uh, my my uh, take of this question is, uh, you know, uh, DDI drug actions in pediatrics. Uh, this is a much more challenging uh, to evaluate than in adults uh, because you can imagine it's uh, uh, not uh, uh, easy to conduct a DDI study in uh, pediatric patients. So uh, sometimes we may have to extrapolate uh, from adults. It uh, really depends on, on the antigeny. Uh, for the uh, metabolic enzyme or transporter uh, underlying the DDI, you know, how that uh, material in pediatric uh, along with uh, age. Um, I think in general, you know, for adolescent, uh, we think uh, it's uh, material enough uh, to be similar to uh, ADAS. And uh, uh, in general, I think, uh, you know, after age of a two or four year old, uh, um, this uh, generally, you know, they maturate. Of course, there could be uh, variability depending on the individual enzyme or transporter. The significant challenge will be very young uh, children. So this is an area that the PPK has been explored and I think uh, will play a significant role, uh, you know, because of uh, the practical challenge conducting the study. We have to leverage uh, all the available uh, resources and the tools to, to evaluate this. All right, thank you for responding to that group of questions. I'm looking at our um, questions that are coming in to see if there are any more highlighted relevant to the presentation. And this time I don't see some. I don't see anything coming in right now. So we will move into our next presentation right into it. And thanks so much for answering the numerous questions that came in. Our next presentation is on clinical drug interaction studies with Combined Oral Contraceptives by Dr. Yinwei Lu, Team Lead, Division of Cardiometabolic and Endocrine Pharmacology in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, also Translational Sciences, and Dr. Li Li, Senior Clinical Pharmacologist, Division of Cardiometabolic and Endocrine Pharmacology in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Office of Translational Sciences in CEDAR. Following this presentation, we'll enter into our final Q&A panel. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Liu. Thank you for the introduction. In this session, I'll give some background and an overview of the final guidance entitled Clinical Drug Interaction Studies with Combined Oral Contraceptives. Then Dr. Li Li will present key recommendations in the guidance. In this presentation, We'll use COCs as the abbreviation for combined oral contraceptives. COCs usually contain two steroid hormones, a progestin and an estrogen. They are widely used in females of reproductive potential in the United States. In 2016, approximately 10 million women used oral contraceptives. This is about a quarter of all contraception users. Many investigational drugs are co-prescribed with COCs after approval. According to a survey on prescription drug use in the past 30 days, almost a half of women 18 to 44 years of age use at least one prescription drug. And 12% of women at this age use three or more prescription drugs, 
the concomitant use with other drugs may inhibit or induce the enzymes involved in the clearance of hormones contained in COCs, causing changes in their systemic exposure. The consequence of such drug interactions can be serious. Decreased systemic exposure of COCs may lead to unplanned pregnancy, while increased exposure may increase the risk of developing venous thromboembolism, or VTE, a rare but serious adverse event. Therefore, when developing drugs intended to be used in females of reproductive potential, evaluation of drug interactions with COCs is important. Before this guidance was available, there were many challenges or questions for drug interaction evaluations with COCs. For example, many sponsors were unclear whether a clinical drug interaction study with COCs should be conducted when developing a drug. How much changing exposure of COCs is clinically meaningful? Is it appropriate to use results from a clinical drug interaction study with one COC to determine if another COC can be used concomitantly with the investigational drug? Also, there were no standardized labeling languages and format for content and location of including drug interaction information with COCs how to describe and interpret the results of such a clinical drug interaction study in a label, what are risk mitigation strategies for clinically significant interactions. Therefore, this guidance was developed to address the above questions and help the sponsors evaluate the effects of their investigational drugs on COCs. Next, I'd like to give an overview of the history of the guidance development. In 2012, the FDA draft guidance on drug interactions briefly described the need of assessing the effects of teratogens on contraceptives. Three years later, FDA hosted a public meeting seeking input from experts on the public health concerns associated with drug interactions that may affect the efficacy and safety of hormonal contraceptives. Following that, the agency's effort on this topic continued. This effort led to publication of multiple review articles in peer-reviewed journals. Because COCs may be concomitantly used with various drugs and the consequence of drug interactions can be serious. FDA expanded this topic further into a standalone draft guidance in 2020, and the final guidance was issued in 2023. The agency considered comments received on the draft guidance as the guidance was finalized. Compared to the draft guidance, the final guidance included more explanations and scenarios when a clinical drug interaction study with COCs may or may not be recommended. Recommendations for non-teratogenic drugs that are intended to be used as a combination therapy with teratogenic drugs were added. The final guidance also included alternative options for choosing COCs and more examples of pharmacodynamic parameters for clinical drug interaction studies with COCs. This is the table of contents of the guidance. This guidance focuses solely on metabolism-based drug interactions with COCs. It provides recommendations on when clinical drug interaction studies with COCs should be conducted, study design, the interpretation of results, and whether it is possible to extrapolate the results of such studies to other COCs and how to communicate study results and risk mitigation strategies in labeling. In addition, the appendix provides decision trees for determining when clinical drug interaction studies with COCs should be conducted. Most used progestins in COCs in the United States include norethanone, levonorgestrel, drosperinone, and norgestimate. Ethanoestradiol and estradiol valerate are examples of estrogens contained in COCs. As I mentioned earlier, exposure change of COCs due to drug interactions may adversely impact their efficacy and safety. For example, 
Reduced progesterone exposure can lead to unintended pregnancy, and decreased estrogen exposure can cause bleeding pattern changes and compromise the effectiveness of COCs. Conversely, increased estrogen or progesterone exposure may lead to safety concerns. Estenoestradiol is the most used estrogen in COCs. The use of COCs containing 50 microgram ethanoestradiol or more has been reported to be associated with a clinically meaningful increase in the risk of developing VTE. For products containing 35 microgram ethanoestradiol, a 40% increase in ethanoestradiol exposure is expected to result in exposure similar to that from COCs containing 50 microgram ethanoestradiol. Therefore, greater than 40% exposure increase in ethanoestradiol for COCs containing 35 microgram ethanoestradiol may lead to increase the VTE risk. Because both directions of exposure change for COCs can be clinically significant, the guidance provides a framework on how to evaluate both induction and inhibition potential of investigational drugs on the metabolism of hormones in COCs. The table on this slide shows enzymes involved in the phase one and phase two metabolism of the most used estrogen and progestins that I showed on the previous slide. Now, realgestamine shown in the last row is the major active metabolite of norgestimate, responsible for the efficacy of norgestimate. As you can see, cytochrome P453A or CYP3A is involved in the metabolism of all five active moieties. Other enzymes such as sulfotransferases and UDP glucuronosyl transferases also contribute to the metabolism of ethanoestradiol and levonorgestrel. Therefore, recommendations in the guidance are based on available data on the metabolic pathways and from clinical drug interaction studies. I've covered the background for the guidance. Now, I'd like to turn the floor to Dr. Lee for a deeper dive into the guidance. Thank you, Yanhui. Before proceeding with the recommendations on whether a clinical DDI study with the COC is needed, we would like to first provide you the scientific rationale behind it. As previously noted, the effectiveness of the contraceptive is primarily driven by the progesterone level. Therefore, when the investigational drugs show CYP3A induction potential, we will focus on how progesterone exposure is affected. This first plot shows the effect of strong, moderate, and weak CYP3A inducers on the AUC of commonly used progestins in the U.S. Symbols and bars indicate geometric mean ratio and 90% confidence intervals, respectively. Shaded area indicates a default no effect boundary of 0.8 and 1.25. As shown in this figure, progesterone exposure reduced significantly by strong CYP3A inducers and some moderate CYP3A inducers, leading to a potential contraceptive failure. Weak CYP3A inducers seem to have less impact than moderate inducers. The extent of interaction depends on CYP3A induction potential of the perpetrator drug as well as the sensitivity of the individual progesterone. Therefore, when the investigational drug is a weak CYP3A inducer, a clinical DDI study with a COC is recommended to determine the impact on the COC exposure. These findings lead to the development of the decision tree that helps to determine whether a clinical DDI study with a COC is necessary. When the investigational drug show induction potential based on in vitro data, 
and a clinical DDI study is recommended according to the general DDI guidance. The sponsor could directly conduct a study with a COC or rely on the clinical DDI study results from a CYP3A probe substrate. If the data show the interacting drug does not induce CYP3A, then no further study with the COC is needed, and we expect no impact on COC efficacy. On the other side, if the results show the interacting drug is a strong CYP3A inducer, then clinical significant reduction in the exposures of COC are likely to occur. As a result, there's no need to conduct a COC DDI study, and instead, a mitigation strategy to address the potential contraception failure will be included in the product label. If the investigational drug is a moderate CYP3A inducer, sponsors should consider conducting a dedicated DDI study with the COC to evaluate the magnitude of exposure reduction of the COC. In the absence of clinical DDI study, labeling should include the same mitigation strategy as for strong CYP3A inducers. If the investigational drug turns out to be a weak CYP3A inducer, then a clinical DDI study with the COC is recommended to determine that a specific COC can be used concomitantly. If the sponsor do not intend to conduct such a study, adequate justification should be provided. Some of the consideration include the anticipated magnitude of drug interaction and whether the investigational drug has any reproductive and developmental toxicity based on non-clinical data. Sponsors are encouraged to consult the relevant review division in such case. Moving on to the impact of CYP3A inhibition. As previously noted, for a COC that contains a dose of 35 microgram of ethanol estradiol, a more than 40% exposure increase may lead to an increased risk of VTE and other thrombolic complications. Therefore, when the investigational drug shows CYP3A inhibition potential, our focus is the impact on the ethanol estradiol exposure. The first plot presented in this slide shows the impact of strong, moderate, and weak CYP3A inhibitors on ethanol estradiol exposure. The maximum exposure increase in the presence of strong CYP3A inhibitors was only about 60%, as seen in the top right corner of the plot. Upon further analysis, most perpetrators that cause more than 40% increase in ethanol estradiol exposures are dual inhibitors. For example, voriconazole and fluconazole also inhibit CYP2C9 and atazanavir also inhibits UGT1A1. So what we learned from this plot is ethanol estradiol is not sensitive to CYP3A inhibition alone. However, a greater impact is observed when a perpetrator also inhibits other enzymes involved in the ethanol estradiol metabolism. It should be noted that potent SALT1E1 inhibitors can significantly increase ethanol estradiol exposures. It has been widely known that sulfate conjugation play a major role in the first pass metabolism of ethanol estradiol, with SALT1E1 being the primary isoform for sulfation. The impact of SALT1E1 inhibition on ethanol estradiol exposure was demonstrated in two recent clinical DDI studies.
in the presence of Zeri Taxis that C max and AUC of ethanol isotyl increased by 2.8 and 2.4 fold respectively. Based on in vitro data, Zeri Taxis that is a salt 1E1 inhibitor, and other evidence indicate that a significant inhibition on CYP3A or UGT1A1 at the studied dose is unlikely. Another example is etorecoxib, which is also a UGT1E1 inhibitor based on in vitro study. And the clinical DDI study showed that concomitant administration of etorecoxib increased ethanol isotyl CMAX by 80% and AUC by 50 to 60%. The mechanism of interaction via salt inhibition is also supported by about 40% reduction in the AUC of ethanol isotyl sulfate metabolites. Let's now proceed to the decision tree for CYP3A inhibition. When the in vitro data indicate the investigational drug is a CYP3A inhibitor, and a clinical DDI study is deemed necessary based on the general DDI guidance, the sponsor could directly do a DDI study with the COC or rely on the results from a clinical DDI study with a sensitive CYP3A substrate. If the data show the investigational drug is not or only a weak CYP3A inhibitor, then a DDI study with the COC is not needed, and we expect no impact on COC. If the investigational drug is a moderate or strong CYP3A inhibitor, and it also inhibits another enzyme involved in the metabolism of ethanol estradiol, then the sponsor should conduct a COC DDI study to quantify the magnitude of the interaction. Considering the inhibition of SALT1E1 alone could lead to a significant increase in ethanol estradiol exposures. For drugs that inhibit SALT1E1, a clinical DDI study with COC should be considered regardless of the inhibitory effect on CYP3A, or appropriate mitigation strategies should be proposed in the label. One situation that has not been covered by the decision trees presented earlier is for drugs with teratogenic potential. Due to high risk of birth defects and development disorders, if the investigational drug is intended for use in women of childbearing potential, a clinical DDI study with the COC is required to confirm the presence or absence of the interaction, regardless of the in vitro or in vivo evidence. Switching gears to the COC DDI study design. Either premenopausal or postmenopausal women can be included in the DDI assessment. However, including premenopausal women allows for the assessment of pharmacodynamic endpoints, which cannot be studied in postmenopausal subjects. Similar to the recommendations from the general DDI guidance, the perpetrator should be given at the highest proposed therapeutic dose for a sufficient duration to ensure a maximum inhibition or induction potential. The COC can be dosed either as a single dose or multiple dose for the PK assessment. For a PD assessment, multiple dose of a COC are recommended. Regarding the choice of COC, sponsors should use COCs that contain the most commonly used progestins in the United States, such as norethindrum, levonorgestrel, Drosperinol and Nargestimate, such that the study results can directly inform 
the clinical use. Among the four commonly used progestins, drosperinol is more sensitive to CYP3A modulation, and therefore a negative results from drosperinol can be extrapolated to COCs containing progestins that are less sensitive to CYP3A induction, for example, norethindrome or levonorgestrel. On the other hand, studying the COCs um, containing less sensitive progestin can maximize the chance of confirming the lack of impact of a drug as an inducer on a specific COC. Moving on to results interpretation and labeling recommendations. If the 90% confidence interval for the geometric mean ratios of AUC and CMAX are within 80 to 124% for the COC, no significant drug interactions will be concluded. If the 90% confidence intervals are outside of 80 to 124% boundaries, the totality of evidence should be considered when determining the clinical impact on the COC. In this case, if the DDI study has assessed the pharmacodynamic parameters of the COC, then these pharmacodynamic data could provide supportive evidence regarding the, the impact on the effectiveness of the contraceptive. For the labeling recommendations, if the investigational drug decreased the COC exposures that may reduce the effectiveness of the contraceptive. The product label should recommend use an alternative contraceptive that is not affected by enzyme inducers such as intrauterine system or an additional non-hormonal contraception such as condom. If the investigational drugs increased ethanol estradiol exposures exceeding those observed at a dose of 50 microgram. The product label should recommend avoid use of this product with COCs containing ethanol estradiol or exceeding a specific dose of ethanol estradiol. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to our FDA colleagues who have contributed their expertise and insights in the development of this guidance. We will also like to take this opportunity to thank the various stakeholders who provide valuable comments to the draft guidance. Thank you for your attention. Before we open up the floor for questions, let's have a quick knowledge check. For a new drug intended for use by women of childbearing potential, which of the following can help determine if a clinical DDI study with COCs needs to be conducted? A. In vitro studies indicate the drug has potential to alter the metabolism of hormones in COCs. B. Clinical DDI study indicates the drug is an inhibitor or inducer of CYP3A enzyme. C. Drug has teratogenic potential. D. All of the above. Yes, the answer is D. Both in vitro data and in vivo data from DDI studies with a probe CYP3A substrate can inform the DDI potential of the investigational drug on COC. Considering the significant risk of birth defects, we always recommend a dedicated DDI study to assess how the teratogenic drug may affect the COC exposures when administered to women of childbearing potential. Thank you for the great presentation. We'll now transition into our final Q&A session panel. As a reminder, if you haven't had a chance to enter your question into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We'd like to welcome to the panel, Dr. Gerald Willett, lead physician.
Physician, Division of Urology, Obstetrics, and Gynecology in the Office of Rare Diseases, Pediatrics, Urologic, and Reproductive Medicine in the Office of New Drugs, CEDAR. Looks like we have some questions coming in right now. And the first group of questions is directed to Dr. Yanwei Li. And here, Lu, um, and here is the first question for Dr. Lu. How long should an alternative contraceptive method or an additional contraception be used after discontinuation of an enzyme inducer? Dr. Lou, this is the moderator. Ray, I'm going to go on to the next panelist and then check back in with you after the tech team has had an opportunity to help triage the sound. Moving on to our next panelist, I have a few questions that came in for Dr. Lee. Lee, and here's the first question for Dr. Lee. What criteria is needed to determine whether effectiveness of COC may be affected and if there is a cutoff for exposure change. As stated in the guidance, when the 90% confidence interval of geometric mean ratio for progesterone is lower than um, 80% of no effect boundary, totality of evidence will be reviewed to evaluate the clinical implications. So typically, if the reduction in progestin exposure exceeds 40%, there's a high risk of contraceptive failure, and we would recommend uh, alternative or backup contraceptive methods. However, if the reduction in progestin exposure is within the range of 20 to 30%, it becomes challenging to determine the clinical impact on the effectiveness of the COC because there's no well-established exposure response for most of the progestins in the market. In such cases, um, if the DDI study evaluate the impact on the pharmacodynamic biomarkers, then these PD data um, can provide valuable information for the clinical implications. We also acknowledge that certain progestins like levonorgestrel are available in different dose levels. So when the investigational drug is expected um, to decrease progestin exposure, if the DDI study shows that progestin exposure from the high dose formulation in the presence of the investigational drug is within 80 to 125% range or still higher than those from the low dose formulation, then it, it kind of uh, indicate that the high dose formulation is a reliable contraceptive one co-administered uh, with the investigational drug. So in summary, that without adequate justification, we would use a default um, 80 to 125% range to assess the clinical impact of the COC DDI study. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have a couple more questions for Dr. Lee, and here is the next question. Is there any special consideration when designing the COC DDI study in postmenopausal women comparing to the study in premenopausal women? Uh, that's another great question. Um, the PK of the progestins and estrogens are expected to be similar between pre- and postmenopausal women. Um, however, the pharmacodynamic assessment can only be conducted in premenopausal women. In addition, if the investigational drug has the teratogenic potential, it may be safe to do the DDI study in postmenopausal women to avoid uh, the risk of any unplanned pregnancy. I hope that answered the question. Thank you.
Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Lee in this round, and here's the question. Can you please clarify the rationale of recommending a clinical COCDDI study for drugs with teratogenic potential regardless of in vitro or in vivo DDI evidence? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, this is what we are thinking. The, there have been incidents of unexpected reduction in the COC exposure despite the absence of any interaction potential suggested by in vitro or in vivo data. Although the chance of this unexpected DDI is small um, because of the significant risk of birth defects for drugs with teratogenic potential, we adopt a conservative approach and rely on study data to confirm the reliability of COCs one taken with these type of drugs. Um, thank you. That's my answer. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. I'll check back in with Dr. Yanwei Lu. And here is the first question. How long should an alternative contraceptive method or an additional contraception be used after discontinuation of an enzyme inducer. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry for the uh, tec technical uh, problem that I had earlier. Uh, in this guidance, we recommend that sponsors consider characterizing the time for the induction effect to disappear. That will help identify uh, the duration that an alternative contraceptive method or additional non-hormonal contraception should be used after discontinuation of the investigational drug. Uh, in the absence of that information, it should be a case-by-case -case recommendation. In many cases, continued use of an alternative method or additional non-hormonal contraception for 28 days is recommended after continuation um, of enzyme inducers to maintain contraceptive reliability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for responding to that question. We do have a couple more questions, and here's the next question. Does CMAX reduction in the hormones of combined oral contraceptives affect the efficacy of COCs? That's a great question. Uh, CMAX reduction in the hormonal com components of COCs may compromise the efficacy of COCs. In the guidance, the no effect boundaries of 80 to 125% for geometric mean ratios are recommended for exposure parameters uh, that include both CMAX and AOC. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Liu, and it's the following. What contraceptive methods can a patient use when she is taking a medication that is a strong CYP3A inducer? That's a, another excellent question. For a patient who's taking a medication that is a strong CYP3A inducer, Contraceptives that are not expected to be ex uh, uh, affected by CYP3A uh, inducers are recommended. An uh, intrauterine system is an example for such contraceptives. Non-hormonal contraception such as condom can also be used as an additional contraceptive method in this case to prevent pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few questions that came in from Dr. Gerald Willett. And here's the first question for Dr. Willett. Are there clinical concerns related to DDIs and COCs when you find an increase in progestin component or a decrease in the estrogen component? Uh, thanks for that uh, question. Uh, 
when we when we look at a increase in progestin in the progestin component, uh, generally generally you're not going to have any sort of severe um, uh, adverse reactions in that in that particular case. Um, in general, it's more it, it's more um, uh, I would say mild milder type of reactions. So so you could have headache, you could have some weight loss, you could have some uh, mood disorders, etc. So, so there is a possibility of having a few uh, additional um, adverse reactions if the progestin levels are higher, and then also uh, possibly some unscheduled spotting or bleeding uh, might occur. Also, in terms of the estrogen level being uh, significantly lower or effectively lower, um, uh, we really don't. We, we have our past history of, of contraceptive development to look at. Um, in the 1970s, we had, we had um, ethanyl estradiol at an 80 microgram level. And, and now we have a safe and effective um, uh, birth control pill that contains 10 micrograms. So we've, got, we've had significant reductions in estrogen. And as mentioned earlier, uh, we mainly look at the progestin component for the for the effectiveness in terms of um, uh, preventing pregnancy, and generally the estrogen component helps to stabilize the the endometrial lining. So if you decrease the estrogen level, um, you know, with a DDI uh, with a, with another D, with a DDI uh, component, it might induce you know, some irregular bleeding in those particular patients. So, so generally patients should just be um, uh, told in advance if they're using particular uh, drugs that may impact their birth control pills, what, what sort of things to expect. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions that did come in for Dr. Willette. And here's the next question. Are there clinical concerns where DDIs cause a decrease in progestin concentrations in oral progestin only products. Um, yeah, thank you also for that question. Um, certainly, although the although the guidance document is really focused on on COCs and looking at the at the pattern for both <clears throat> both types of hormones. Uh, we do clinically also have to think about the progestin-only um, uh, products. Now, with the intrauterine systems, they have a considerable local effect too. So, so, so it's not just ovulation that we look at. Um, and but uh, but specifically with some of the oral progestin-only contraceptives, I think we have to be very very careful about any sort of DDI effect there. Because those particular products, historically, we've told patients, be sure to take those at the same time every day and not to miss any. So you can imagine if you have a DDI effect also, uh, you know, then, then the pregnancy rate might, might increase even more with, with a progestin-only oral product. The uh, drosperinone oral product, uh, which has been our most recent in, term, in terms of uh, in terms of new progestin-only uh, tablets, seems to have a little bit more leeway than some of the other older uh, progestin oral products. But still, I would say, you know, if you have a significant uh, induction effect here and a reduction in the in the uh, effective uh, progestin in terms of preventing ovulation, you have to. I would be very very careful with with those particular products. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willett, for responding to that question. We do have one more question in this round, and here's the question. Is there an example of an increased pregnancy rate as a result of a drug-drug interaction? Now, thank you again for that, uh, for that question. Uh, around uh, 2014 to 2016, there were two significant studies at least two significant studies in Africa uh, that showed us that there would be an increase um, uh, pregnancy rate if you used if a DDI induction uh, was active. 
And this applied to HIV positive patients um, who were taking efavirenz and who were also using a long acting contraceptive um, that had two subdermal uh, implants. The reduction in the uh, levonorgestrel in those implants was approximately 50%. And the pregnancy rate jumped up to over 10% in one study when you would normally expect those implants to keep the pregnancy rate down below 1%. So it was a tenfold increase, at least in one study, and, a, and, and it also another study uh, where they were comparing another HIV drug, which had no effect on pregnancy, but the efavirenz in that particular study also. also. So this was certainly one case where we saw the end result being an increased pregnancy rate that was documented, um, as opposed to seeing percentage numbers and then sort of trying to counsel patients or you know inform labels that this event may may occur. So, so that was that was one significant thing that we saw around that time period. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. <clears throat> Got a couple of questions that came in for Dr. Shending Yang. And here's the first question for Dr. Yang. Do you have examples of SUT1E1 inhibitors that are currently on the market? Uh, well, mm, not to, to my knowledge. Um, but the, the, the um, one limitation is that uh, um, in the past, this has not been. This was not uh, routinely evaluated, so there is a big uh, knowledge gap uh, on uh, a number of drugs whether they have effect on self transfer as one e one or not. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Yang, and it's the following: What is FDA's perspective of utilizing? PBPK modeling in the area of COC DDI risk assessment? Yeah, that's a, a very great question. Um, uh, you know, I, I think PBPK has a utility here. Uh, it has uh, been uh, involving uh, in the past, the uh, PBPK model was developed for uh, estrogen part, maybe uh, as new estrogen LEE. Uh, but as uh, uh, nicely described by Dr. Lee and Dr. Lu in their presentation, uh, the efficacy is uh, more often driven by the progesterone part, uh, and the pregnancy failure is, of course, uh, a big concern for contraceptive drug. So uh, there are um, very recent publication uh, developing PPP model, uh, also for progesterone part. Uh, in the, uh, I think the publication is coming up or, or will come soon, for example, on clinical pharmacology and the therapeutics. Um, so, uh, you know, when companies uh, are pursuing use of PPK as a justification or part of uh, the evidence, uh, you know, it's welcome to consult a uh, review division, you know, at the early stage. And another thing is that uh, uh, whenever the study was is conducted uh, in, in clinical data study of a PBK, um, you know how to interpret uh, the the results of a PK change as a clinical significant or insignificant. Uh, this has also to be put in the context of um, um, you know the relationship of PK change and exposure uh, and and the and, 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 uh, and uh, efficacy relationship of. Uh, of a, a drug, this is general form for you know any drug. Um, uh, a limitation or hurdle here is that uh, lots of this uh, uh, COC they were developed uh, a number of years ago, and by at that time they haven't been uh, uh, studied as extensively as a uh, drug developed nowadays. So um, there's still some uh, gap about the understanding of uh, the concentration re efficacy relationship. Yeah, and also for uh, this uh, 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 progestins, uh, uh, because they were developed in the past, uh, even for the enzyme uh, contributing to the metabolism of uh, this progestin, uh, we uh, still have limited understanding on the quantitative contribution uh, 
you know, quantitatively, we know that uh, some enzymes uh, involved, uh, but uh, quantitatively, uh, there are uh, very limited uh, uh, information or knowledge. So that's also another thing. Uh, if additional study can be conducted to fill the knowledge gap, that will be helpful for the development of a PPK model. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to Dr. Yenwei Lu. We do have a question that came in. Can you please comment on perpetrator DDI potential for COCs? That's a great question. Um, COCs may impact others and affect the safety and efficacy of uh, concomitantly used drugs. For example, ethanol estradiol is a weak to moderate uh, inhibitor of CYP1A2. Concomitant use of COCs um, may increase the exposure of CYP1A2 substrates, which may increase the risk of adverse reactions of these substrates. Another example is concomitant use of COCs containing ethanol estradiol could also decrease the exposure of lamotrigine, an uh, anti-seizure drug, which may reduce the efficacy of lamotrigine. Therefore, it is important um, also uh, to characterize the effect of COCs as a perpetrator on the exposure of investigational drugs during development. But in this guidance, the recommendations are for COCs uh, being as victims. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have another question that came in for Dr. Lee. Lee. And here is the question for Dr. Lee. Could you comment on the value of a PD biomarker for COC DDI studies? Um, thank you for the good question. So um, if the investigational drug shows CYP3A induction potential, and expects to reduce the COC exposure, um, then the PD assessment may be useful to uh, interpret the DDI study data when the PK is resi uh, resides outside of the bioequivalence limit. So I think if, for example, if the uh, investigational drug shows a CYP3A inhibition potential, then the PD assessment may not be needed in that case. But again, if the investigational drug shows a uh, uh, induction potential and you expect to have a decreased COC exposure, the PD data will provide uh, good insights in terms of the impact uh, on the COC efficacy. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're moving on to Dr. Shining. Yang, we have another question for Dr. Yang that just came in. Is there any decision tree or guidance for COC DDI when a drug is a UGT 1A1 inhibitor? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, my understanding of the question is that uh, if um, um, it found that uh, an investor drug inhibit uh, UGT Y1 from an in vitro experiment. Uh, uh, how likely you know it will have such an effect uh, in uh, in vivo in humans? Um, unfortunately, so far there hasn't been such a, a criteria established for UGT enzyme, not only UGT Y1 but also other UGT SO form. Uh, we don't have such criteria uh, set as uh, set up for sick enzyme or transporter. Uh, this is mainly because of much fewer uh, data, especially uh, clinical data, to allow uh, establishing such a, a criteria. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, we are doing some uh, in-house work uh, trying to explore whether this is possible. Um, as I uh, described, uh, um, in the in the uh, uh, draft, uh, you know, uh, guideline for SAH, you know, tentatively, um, companies uh, might uh, use the, the same criteria as that applied to SIP enzyme. But of course, it can be argued that uh, whether this is uh, uh, the most appropriate for UGT 
a uh, similar, you know, gap or issue remains for sample transfers uh, 1E1. There are even uh, uh, fewer data for sample transfer 1E1 compared to UGT 1E1. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question came in. It appears to be for Dr. Lee Lee. And we'll read the question and see who jumps in. As per the guidance, justification can be provided for not conducting a DDIs with COCs. When does this justification need to be provided, for example, at the end of phase two meeting or in the NDA? Um, that's a great question. So in general, if you uh, plan to uh, waive the COC DDI study, we encourage you to um, talk to the review division in early in the clinical program. Um, so ideally, if you were to conduct a COC DDI study, um, this study um, should be done like a, ideally it'd be done before the phase three trial so that the COC DDI results can inform the use of contraception in their pivotal uh, trials. So in general that we, again, we would like to encourage you to communicate with the agency um, early in the clinical program. Uh, the other point that we want to make um, is that the, when you thinking about to waive the DDI study, the other um, factor that you should be considering not only to the project projected uh, DDI magnitude of it with the investigational drug, but also you also need to consider the uh, reproductive and developmental toxicity of this particular new drug so that we get a complete picture of the risk um, of untended pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a second part to that question for Dr. Lee, and it's the following. If a weak inducer has low magnitude of CYP3A4 induction, approximately 27 to 30%, and PBB, PBPK DDI simulation indicates very low DDI risk with the COC, will a validated PBPK modeling result suffice for justification? Um, again, that's an, also an excellent question. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the uh, weak cyp 3 8 inducers, I think they, when we had the discussion, it will be assessed case by case. Um, but I do want to point out, as uh, Dr. Xining Yang has mentioned, for a PBPK model, in general, we want to have a good understanding regarding the contributional fraction of each metabolic pathway for progestins. And to our knowledge that uh, most of progestins do not have very well established information. So that PBPK model, um, whether it will have a good prediction on the COC DDI outcome uh, will, will be detailed discussed with the agency so that we can make a well-informed decision. Thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Moving on to Dr. Yinwei Lu. Yinwei Lu. We do have another question that just came in and here is the question, are there any guidances, guidance around the use of medroxyprogesterone acetate and DDI. Thank you for the question. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, for the use uh, and also the drug drug interaction information for a particular medroxy progesterone acetate product, you may refer to the prescribed, uh, prescribed, uh, prescribing information for that pr uh, particular product. Um, a lot of them. Um, we we uh, have seen that uh, drug inducers like a CIF 3 a inducers may decrease the effectiveness of this type of uh, contraceptive products. Uh, so in general, patients uh, are counseled to use a backup method or alternative method of contraception uh, when enzyme inducers are used uh, with uh, this type of product. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you for responding to that question. Moving back to Dr. Shenning Yang. Another question came in, and here is the question. What is the FDA guidance around DDI, DDIs involving UGT induction and risk assessment? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for UGT induction, um, the guidance uh, does not recommend a, a routine evaluation. Uh, well, that doesn't uh, mean UGT is not uh, inducible. Uh, although you know there are uh, much less understanding about the induction mechanism uh, of a UGT isoform, there are some in vitro studies and also clinical studies showing that uh, uh, several UGT isoform they uh, can be induced by the inducers of uh, CYP3A. Um, so, um, but it looks like uh, uh, in general the induction uh, potency of, of UGT, uh, I'll say the sensitivity of UGT to inducer is less than UGT, uh, less than uh, CYP3A. Um, so uh, the the the, the um, the current uh, um, SIH draft guideline has some, uh, I have a brief description on this, uh, so we can leverage uh, the existing results uh, for uh, CYP3 induction by in vitro drug uh, for uh, 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 UGT. Um, if uh, a drug is a significant, it's a, it's a potent uh, inducer of CYP3A, such as, as a strong inducer or more inducer, there's a possibility that it may also induce a UGT. Uh, and whether a further clinical DDS study need to be conducted uh, will depending on several factors, including the induction potency of the drug on CYP3A and uh, the likelihood uh, of um, the drug to be used with uh, drugs uh, uh, that are primarily metabolized by UGT and also the um, uh, concentration to efficacy relationship uh, of those uh, UGT substrates. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving back to Dr. Lee Lee, we do have another question that just came in. What PD endpoints are generally recommended by the agency to evaluate the effect of drug on COCs as supportive information? Thank you for the great question. I think as stated um, on page six of the guidance, uh, we recommend the PD parameters such as estradiol concentration, FSH, the follicle stimulating hormones, LH, um, progesterone um, to be measured during the PD assessment. I think I would like to point out that uh, these PD markers has a relative higher um, variability. So in order to have a meaningful assessment, you may need to consider a large sample size uh, for this kind of PD assessment. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving back to Dr. Yen Wei Lu. Dr. Lu, we have another question just came in for you. And it's the following, if a clinical DDI study shows a drug to be a strong CYP3A, CYP3A inducer, but the drug is only used for seven days, what would be the mitigation strategy for the DDI with combined oral contraceptives? Um, that's a great question. Uh for a strong CYP3A inducer that is to be used for seven days concomitantly uh, with COCs, there may still be a chance to have decreased exposures for COCs. Therefore, that may reduce the effectiveness of the COC. Um, so in this case, the mitigation strategies should be uh, use an alternative contraceptive not affected by enzyme inducers, or use an additional um, non-hormonal contraception. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And we are about run out of time for questions. Just enough time for some housekeeping information. A huge thank you to all the presenters today.